want you to imagine you're in space. You pop into existence as a cute, tiny space robot. And you're not worried right now because you're a robot. You don't need oxygen to survive you. So you're doing pretty fine in space right now. You've got batteries to power you, so you're OK for the next few days. But in a few days, your batteries are going to start running out of juice. So what do you do? You try and collect power somehow. You unfold a solar panel, which collects solar power from the sun and generates powers to recharge your batteries. And then you come across an interesting space rock. You analyze that space rock, and you want to send the data back to Earth. What do you do? You unfold uh, an antenna. And say you want to move on to the next piece of interesting space rock. So you unfold yourself a solar sail, which uses the pressure of light to generate thrust to propel our robots around space. All these devices, solar sails, solar power arrays, antennas, these are devices that we actually equip our space robots with to enable them to explore space better. And the common thing about all three of these devices is the bigger they are, the better they perform. The bigger your solar sail, the more thrust you generate. The bigger your solar power array, the more power you generate. The bigger your antenna, the more power you can beam down, the higher data rates you get. And these devices end up being quite large. That person over there next to that antenna array, that's, that's full scale. That's, that array is the size is twice the length of the stage. And the other pictures I've drawn roughly to scale, so these arrays are enormous the size of tennis courts or football fields. But the biggest rockets we have are about twice the length of the stage. How do you fit something the size of a baseball diamond onto something the size of the stage? Well, you fold it up. And that is my job at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, to take inspiration from the world of origami and the mathematics that underlie origami and use these mathematics to design new ways of folding up these very large structures into very compact spaces so we can launch them and then unfold them when they get to space. This example that I'm showing you right now, this is a fold pattern that was engineered. That was designed by an aerospace engineer named Koryo Miura, and it's named after him. It's called Miura Ori, and it takes this large flat surface, compacts it very nicely, very reliably, without ripping it, without tearing it, without breaking it into a compact package, which can then be launched and then unfolded when you get into space. I'm going to tell you about two projects that I'm working on right now at JPL. And these both projects uh, revolve around origami and how it can be applied to space exploration. The first one is called Starshade. Uh, and to talk about starshades, we really need to talk about exoplanets first. So, an exoplanet is a planet outside our solar system. And now we know of thousands of these exoplanets. These planets exist, and we know they exist. This is Kepler-186f. It's an exoplanet that we think is very close to being earth size and Earth-like. This is the Kepler-11 system, six planets orbiting the same star. This is the TRAPPIST-1 system, which you may have heard about. Seven, seven Earth-like planets orbiting the same star Three of these planets, as we, we suspect, have liquid water on their surface. So the next question is, well, do any of these planets have life on them? Can we detect those signs of life? And we are finding more and more exoplanets each day. Um, this week I checked, we have 3,725 exoplanets that are confirmed. The graph shows you the year of discovery versus how many exoplanets we've discovered. And the color coding tells you what technique we've used to discover these exoplanets. So the green and the red slices of, that, of those charts are the transit method and the radial velocity method. And these methods are indirect methods. We're not actually seeing the planet. What we're seeing are wobbles in the star or the shadow of the planet. Actually seeing the planet is really tricky, which is why when you look at the imaging slice of, those, uh, of this chart, it's a very tiny slice. And the reason it's really tricky to image planets is because stars are really, really bright. When you look at a star through a telescope, this is what you see. The planet is there, but it's so dim compared to the star that it gets lost in the glare of that star. But if you can find a way to kill that starlight, suppress that starlight, the planet pops out. And now you can take a picture of that planet, 
You can do spectroscopic analysis of the planet and tell me if there's oxygen or water or methane on that planet, signs of life on that planet. This is what starshade is. Starshade is a means to suppress that starlight so you can image those planets right next to it. Starshade is a spacecraft 30 meters in diameter, the size of a baseball diamond, that flies in front of a space telescope, casts a shadow, a very deep, dark shadow, creates an eclipse in which that telescope sits. Uh, and in this shadow, the telescope is shielded from the light, the bright light of that star, so it can image that faint planet right next to it. Then the question becomes, how do you package a 30-meter diameter starshade in a four-and-a-half-meter diameter rocket? Well, you fold it up. And once it gets to space, you unfurl your petals, you deploy your ring truss, you unfold this giant baseball diamond-sized spacecraft, which flies away from its space telescope, puts itself between the telescope and the star, blocks that starlight, so you can see the really faint planets orbiting that star, and tell me something about whether those, life, those planets could sustain life. Here's that unfolding sequence in a bit more detail. And the part that I'm working on is the inner part of the star shade, that yellow disk in the middle. That is a solid disk made of a blanket material that has to be perfectly opaque, without any rips, without any tears, without any gaps in it, that would allow the starlight to leak through. So we can't have any rips or tears in it. And how do you fold up this um, giant baseball diamond-sized piece of blanket into a small rocket? You use origami. This is the fold pattern we're using to fold up that blanket, that optical shield, we call it, of the star shade. Um, in this diagram, the red lines represent valley folds, the blue lines represent mountain folds, and this fold pattern was designed by a computer. This was designed algorithmically using the rules of origami, the mathematics of origami, which dictate that you cannot stretch paper, that you cannot cut paper. Between the folded state and the flat state, you must preserve the lengths on the surface of the paper. Um, and using those rules of, uh, and mathematics behind origami, we can engineer, we can design uh, optimally uh, designed pieces of origami. And then we take that computational design, that computer design, and prototype it. There's a one meter paper prototype, and that's the nice thing about origami, you can prototype in paper. There's a two meter diameter acrylic model that we made up. And the thing that I'm most proud of is this five meter diameter piece of origami made of flight-like materials um, with uh, that ring truss that you see integrated in our high bay at, at JPL. And this is a model that we can use to test out how to engineer the system properly. How does it unfold? How does it fold up? Does it deploy reliably? Does it de deploy the same every time? And this is what the deployment of this looks like. So this is a, uh, a model that packs up very tightly, and it needs to be offloaded. So it needs to behave in the same way that it would in the microgravity of space. Well, we want to test out systems on Earth the same way they would act in space. So somehow, we have to kill Earth's gravity. And the way we're doing this in this system is by suspending it on multiple lines which go over counterweights, which hold up the system in place. Next, I want to switch to talking about unfolding CubeSat antennas. Um, CubeSats, for those of you who don't know, are spacecraft that are extremely tiny, which means they're very inexpensive to build and to experiment with and to use for Earth observing missions. These two CubeSats went up last week. I was there at the launch on Saturday, and these two CubeSats, Marco A and Marco B, were sent towards Mars. These are tiny spacecraft. There you can see my colleague, Joel Steinkraus, next to Marco A and Marco B. These are absolutely tiny spacecraft packed with commercial electronics, so they're very inexpensive and very tiny. To, uh, very, very tiny. And we can experiment with them and we can play with them. And because these CubeSats are so tiny, we need structures that unfold on them to give them a bit more capability. Because Marco A and Marco B are going to Mars, they need to unfold large solar arrays so they can, they can collect solar power next to Mars. And they need to unfold large antennas, which is that square patch array that you see, so they can communicate from Mars to Earth. 
And the bigger that antenna we can make, the bigger we can make that antenna, the further out we can send these CubeSats, not only to Mars, but to Jupiter and Saturn and Uranus and Neptune, further and deeper into the solar system. So that was one of the missions that I had when I came into JPL, was to engineer bigger antennas for CubeSats. This is what antennas for CubeSats really look like uh, right now. And these are missions that are either half flown or will fly very soon. And the figure of merit when it comes to antenna power is really antenna size, the area of the antenna. And the biggest antenna that is currently flown is the Marco antenna with about 0.2 meters square of area. I wanted to build an antenna that was 10 times as big. So I came up with this concept, which is two meters square of area, 10 times bigger than the 0.2 meters. And we call this ladder, or the large area deployable reflector array. And this entire one and a half meter by one and a half meter antenna, so that's basically my wingspan by my wingspan, antenna needs to fold up into a container the size of a coffee cup, and then obviously unfold out without any damage perfectly in a flat configuration. This is the way we're folding up this giant antenna. This is an early folding prototype that I made of this antenna. This is a meter by a meter, so a bit smaller than the design, but it packages into that small coffee cup sized cylinder. And this is the way it folds up. You start off by folding the antenna into a cruciform arrangement, into the cross arrangement, and then taking the four arms of the cross and wrapping them around each other until they end up in that cylindrical folded form. One thing we care a lot about when we're folding up spacecraft structures is volume efficiency, right? It's, it's the same problem you have when you're packing suitcases. You want to fill up as much of your suitcase as possible with clothing and as little of it with empty air. And this packaging method is extremely volume efficient. There's very little wasted space in the, contained in the packaged volume so that when it's fully unfolded, your deployed structure can be as large as possible. And once it's unfolded, we have to somehow find a way of, once it's folded, we have to somehow find a way of unfolding it. And if this video will play, it, go, it goes from being wrapped up in that tight configuration to being unwrapped and then unfolded sequentially from the inside out. This antenna that I'm showing you right now, this is really a continuation of my work when I was a PhD student at Caltech, working on inventing new ways of folding these very large structures into very compact spaces. Um, this idea of taking structures that look like a collection of strips that have engineered discontinuities in them that can then be folded and then wrapped into tight configurations. I remember when I first had this idea, I was at a hotel room at 2 a.m. right after a conference with my colleague Nicholas, and we were talking about how to fold up very large solar arrays into very tiny CubeSats so we could send these CubeSats much further than they'd previously gone. And for the past two years before that point, I had been obsessed with the idea of sending CubeSats to interplanetary space. And it was in this moment that we realized that by engineering discontinuities into the system, by coming up with this folding method, we could pack a lot more material into a CubeSat without breaking anything, without plastically deforming anything. And it was in that moment that I realized that we could actually beat the state of the art by factors of 10 or 100 in terms of how much we can pack into small spaces reliably. I remember being really excited about this idea and I took it to my PhD advisor, who was, who was my boss at the time, and I told him about it, and he absolutely disliked the idea. He, in, instead of encouraging me to pursue this really kooky idea of basically making cuts everywhere in a structure and folding it, he discouraged me. He asked me to not work on it. But I was obsessed. I was entirely captured by this idea, and I continued working on it, on the side, essentially, despite him not being entirely interested in it. I'm talking to you about it right now, and that's because this idea became the core of my PhD thesis. This is what I got my degree for, was inventing this idea, 
needless to say, my advisor soon came around and realized that this was actually a neat idea. And now this idea is at the core of a lot of the research that he's working on right now, which includes uh, some really crazy ideas to collect solar power in space and beam it down to the Earth in microwaves to uh, solve the sustainable energy problem. But, and I'm using this idea right now to build larger antennas for CubeSats. Um, and the thing that I want to pull out from the story and tell you about and really impress upon you is that it's okay to be obsessed by an idea and continue on doing it, even though people will say that it may not work. You really have to, and you've heard this before, remain curious and indulge your curiosity and explore in a manner that is fearless, right? You can't be afraid based on what other people tell you. Um, you have to remain curious and stay obsessed by these ideas. And that's really the reason I am where I am right now is that this, there was this one idea that captured me, that held me, and I didn't let go of that obsession. I want to end by this quote from one of my favorite writers, Terry Pratchett, and he's a fantasy writer. And this is something that occurs very early on in the book Wintersmith, where he's talking about a, 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 a witch. This witch is using this as a spell or an oath. And it is really a quote, it's a testament to the power of obsession. It says, this I choose to do. If there is a price, this I choose to pay. If it is my death, then I choose to die. Where this takes me, there I choose to go. I choose. This I choose to do. So I ask you, choose to be obsessed. Thanks. <laughs>